Well, Dominika Schwartz, thank you so much for joining us here at the Hague Summit on International Law and Human Rights and for your excellent speech. And we'd just like to ask you a few questions to your thoughts and opinions on some salient issues. The first one would be, based on your experience in the field of counter-terrorism and peace operations, do you think that the concept and adaptation of human rights changes after terror events? And is the removal of human rights ever justifiable? Well, thanks for the question and uh, thanks for having me here as well. It was a great pleasure to, to talk to you, with you. Um, this is an interesting question, of course, and one that uh, even can have a very simple observation answer. Of course, the perception of human rights, the implementation of human rights change uh, after the terror events. Uh, sometimes the change will be temporary, is in ad adaptation, is in taking away certain liberties in order to increase the security rights immediately after the events. Uh, but what we have also seen, particularly of course after the 9-11 events, uh, 14 years ago, that we have also had changes and adaptations um, in the perception of human rights, implementation of human rights more in more long-term sense. Um, what I would say is an interesting trend that is talked about less is how we ourselves have started to perceive our own liberties and rights differently after these events. You see, of course, the tightening of security measures at the airports um, and uh, border crossings. You see um, more extreme emergency, so-called emergency measures that now last for, for years already in terms of, um, in terms of uh, intelligence gathering, so in terms of spying, in terms of uh, what we are now exposed to as plain citizens in terms of our privacy rights, for example. Um, and what I find worrying in this context is, for example, how we tend to just gloss over that and accept this um, cutting of our own liberties. Mm -hmm. uh, people n now find it perfectly acceptable to be strip searched and waiting in long lines in the security in the name of, of security, where, of course, the question first would be, are these measures in, in fact effective? Mm -hmm. Are they achieving what they are purporting to achieve? Uh, we have not been asking for any such analysis uh, and just silently accept uh, what's going on, for example. So this is, this is one perspective of it. In our, let's say, Western societies, we kind of accept curtailing of human liberties and rights in the name of security. On the other side, of course, we have the other trend which goes into adaptation or a changing in the implementation and perception of human rights uh, as they regard to a particular religious or ethnic group, uh, we have seen, of course, a certain rise in the, let's say, xenophobia or intolerance towards mm -hmm. Muslim uh, societies um, as in being the scapegoat for all these terrorist events. And we would be uh, quite willing to accept cutting and curtails in human rights and liberties of a particular segment of society, which would be the Muslims. And even there, of course, in the same practical examples, we would see, for example, different screening measures imposed on people who are sort of anticipated mm. to be more suspicious and so on. So this is more like on a, on a, on a common sense level rather than a legal level uh, and an explanation of the observation that I have had. Um, and of course we should be careful as to how far we are going to let that balance between human security or rather our security and human rights tip towards the security on account of cutting down our liberties mm. and rights. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent answer, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move on to something a little different. I feel that feminism and women's rights have been well, in the forefront of a lot of people's minds. It's been in the news recently. I was wondering, do you think that um, more should be done at a state and legislature level to encourage gender equality? That's again a very interesting question and one that has, I would say, a twofold answer. Uh, the first answer is, especially coming from a woman, of course, and my own experience, I would say, of course, there is always space for improvement. There is always um, opportunities for this state apparatus to, of course, on a formal level, push for wider um, rights of, of women for positive discrimination measures, if you want, uh, introducing quotas in parliaments. Of course, we have to be sensitive to cultural differences and realities of every particular country and culture in this sense. But of course, within a particular segment, particular culture, there is space for that. And I would consider um, this state apparatus to have an important role 
to play in enforcing and enlarging the scope of women's rights, um, their um, opportunities for bigger participation in the society, um, in business and so on. But I would not focus so much on the role of states um, and legislators in this sense because I think a lot has been done and is being mm -hmm. done as we speak in that, um, in that direction. What is more important now that we have been given certain measures, certain wider rights and we have been given encouragement measures uh, to be able to participate in this man's world in, in, a, in a more prominent way, we also have to take that chance. I think now maybe the, the focus should be more on our own um, willingness to do so, understanding on how we can do it. So we should have started, with now I think we should focus more on the grassroots approach, informing women of the rights they do have, because some of us maybe are aware of this and others aren't. Mm. So there will be maybe women to women mm. education on what rights they have, what opportunities, what are the positive discrimination measures that they could um, sort of um, take advantage of in order to uh, better participate, to, to empower themselves. And at the same time, every woman for herself, of course, has to make that decision on how much she wants to, uh, to use the, these, um, these particular measures and advantages and, and, and sort of lean in and participate. And that, of course, we see with um, our sort of post-feminist uh, generation of women, if you want, that we do struggle um, in finding the balance between the professional life, uh, being empowered as a participant in a society, mm -hmm. in business and so on, in the economy, and, of course, women as just, you know, human beings, human creatures who also want to have satisfy their personal lives. And mm -hmm. perhaps there is more space for women themselves to find a balance there, to find how they could still mm -hmm. combine both and try to have it all. Mm -hmm. um, but also in that sense, of course, I think that the state could help. So not just in finding measures whereby women would have, there would be bigger quotas for parliaments or um, uh, CEOs of companies, but whereby the, the state would, of course, um, encourage by improving, uh, let's say, um, children's care systems, schooling options, um, taxing, uh, of course, advantages um, for women who work, uh, for, for women with children and so on. So basically this whole wide set of measures that would enable the woman that wants to lean in, that wants to contribute, mm -hmm. to do so without paying a massive tax mm -hmm. on her personal life and raising a family. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's great. So I have a, a shorter question, but perhaps more complicated to answer. <laughs> Would you say that the ICDY practices cultural diplomacy? That would, of course, I mean, this is a complicated question, and as I, uh, I mean, it would uh, be helpful to know what precisely you mean by practicing cultural diplomacy, whether you're asking uh, if the ICDY in its processes um, external processes in its, uh, let's say, jurisprudence in its judicial processes, is aware of cultural differences and being sensitive to them, conscious of them in dealing with the cases? Um, or are you asking more internally, does the ICTY, let's say as an employer, uh, mm -hmm. practice cultural diplomacy within, its, within the institution itself, so within its employment practices and daily work practices? And I think both questions are equally interesting. Um, I don't know if you have a special preference or, or I could just briefly give my opinion on both. I think the answer is definitely yes, um, although the ic particularly has been criticised for being a uh, North American monopolised in a way, but that of course does not mean that um, the external and internal processes of the ic do not incorporate and respect the uh, cultural diversities. Of course, the ICTY is a court with jurisprudence, with, with jurisdiction over a particular region, so uh, it would be in that sense a little bit one-dimensional, as in focusing on that particular region, regional uh, specificities, but within that context, of course, it has to be very sensitive to these cultural sensitivities, um, making sure, particularly in the areas of victim participation, uh, and in the areas of witness um, examinations and so on, to pay attention to these cultural differences uh, when conducting its judicial uh, procedures. Um, and at the same time, I mean, in the lab, on the level of the victim participation and taking care of, of the wider victims of the conflict in the Balkans, the ICTY has a very important role to play and it plays that role very actively. 
uh, particularly now in the winding down of the court of the tribunal, uh, where of course um, the court is now very much uh, concerned and focused on bringing um, out its legacy. Um, and one of that legacies is, for example, a project that the ICTY prosecution team that I work for is currently working on, which is a project on the uh, sexual abuse and sexual offences, so uh, sexual crimes as war crimes and crimes against humanity. And this will be an important uh, uh, book project coming out, an important academic project contributing uh, to the discourse of, of these, on, these, um, on these issues, of course. So that would be one way in which the ICTY contributes, and I would say practices cultural diplomacy. Um, it also does a lot of work with the victims of the, the conflict. Uh, for example, we, we have recently had a, another visit from a group of uh, relatives of the victims of the genocide in Srebrenica, the so-called very well-known group of the mothers of Srebrenica, who have again attended the delivery of the mm -hmm. judgment, which is very important for them, um, and had then later after that also met with the prosecutor uh, to discuss what more can be done to help the victims, uh, even two decades after the conflict. So also I think in that sense, uh, the tribunal itself and its you know, uh, various elements from defense to prosecution are doing their best to, to also be in contact with, uh, with people from the region and I think that's one of the ways also to practice cultural diplomacy there. Thank you very much, that was excellent. And so final question for you today. Um, so the world is becoming more global. Um, do you think that this promotes or negates the adaptation of human rights? Another, yes, another not uh, a question that's, that, that doesn't have a black and white answer. It's quite impossible to, to, to say that it would be either negating or promoting the adaptation. I think it does both in some ways. And, uh, and as I've said in my, not in the speech, but in the Q&A session before, um, we have a big role to play there as citizens who sort of take advantage and uh, and use these uh, the new the new aspects of this globalized community, as they've called it, globalized world, the social media that's proliferating and um, connecting us across the world. Of course, the way we use it, um, the way we let these um, these programs, these applications, uh, these tools of social media, and so on. Uh, infringe on our liberties, particularly the, the, our right, rights to privacy, uh, protection of personal data mm -hmm. and so on, is of course also up to us. You know, what we put out there to the world is our choice, uh, but I think that it might, like, accepting more and more of the violation or peeking into our private lives on our own might reduce our sensitivities to understanding that the right to privacy and protection of personal data is very important. Um, this is just you know, an illustration because the question is complex, but in this particular area we have seen um, a lot of negative, um, I would say, effects on the protection and respect for human rights across the world precisely because we are so much more willing to share our personal data and we are reducing our understanding of how important protection of that of personal uh, data is. and you know occasionally sharing photos of friends or stories or videos had led to, you know, uh, tragic, tragic consequences such as somebody be feeling ashamed of anything that's been put on the, on the World Wide Web, uh, committing suicide in the extreme events or just, you know, feeling excluded from the society. This, of course, is with the infringement of human rights on this micro level where we, unaware of it, but we do um, basically disrespect human rights of other individuals uh, by you know making everything so global and out in the open, um, and again going back to, to to the first question you posed and to the comment I made, of course this globalization also means that we are um, exposing ourselves to security uh, threats and risks that we were not exposed to before, and in this process might have to accept certain um, in certain reduction and, uh, and adaptation of of the scope of our human rights. Uh, but we have to be very careful as to how far we go, how much we let that happen, how to find that balance. Um, and most importantly, even though we might be willing to temporarily or more long term accept a certain infringement of our human rights or reduction of the scope, uh, we should not let go of those human rights as a principle and just all together, you know, sort of hold, make a wholesale of our rights and liberties uh, or the rights and liberties of others. So. Um, it is up to, I think, the common citizen in this global world to start reflecting on these issues 
uh, and then that should hopefully translate into, of course, uh, actions on higher levels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. It was a big pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>